what Peter was talking about is kind of a similar uh, subject that Rüdiger uh, Troyok, uh, who is uh, coming on stage next, is talking about from a slightly different perspective. He's talking about biocommons. So how to uh, license, how to enable, uh, how to take uh, products from uh, bioresearch uh, and make them uh, accessible, make the knowledge accessible to uh, work uh, with it. Rüdiger? Show is yours. Um, oh, thanks. And this guy, you saw he is a scientist, you know, he, he was one of the few that knew what the dot is about. Yeah. And uh, he is also working at um, the Technology Assessment Bureau for the German Parliament. So basically he knows what he's talking about. Um, actually, uh, I will skip a bit of the slides because um, Peter it perfectly introduced what I wanted to talk about and I will spend a bit more time on the um, data that I want to show you. Microphone, like this? Okay. So, this way. Okay. So um, the BioStrike project is uh, the starting point for my um, ideas about the biocommons. Uh, common goods are not owned by individuals and allow for the use by everyone. So with antibiotics, we have um, general availability for everyone to use the stuff, but it is ruining our common good, which is um, the bacteria that are susceptible to these antibiotics. Because if we overuse them, the uh, um, bacteria become superbugs, and then we cannot use them anymore, and everyone is affected. So um, the property of these bacteria uh, that we can kill them with um, antibiotics is someone that is a common good in my eyes. So we have to, okay, I'll skip these slides because Peter perfectly introduced that. Yep. What? Okay, so the solutions that we have heard so far from, uh, from the governments is um, that we have to manage um, the use of antibiotics better, the ones that we still have, there's not many left. Uh, we have to regulate it, we have to educate people, like all these top-down approaches. We have to research more, but it's not really happening, and I mean, the problem was known for 30 years now, and no one did anything about it, although it's perfectly solvable in my eyes. Um, so we have to find entirely new ways to tackle the problem, and the BioStrike initiative, for me, is a perfect example how to go on. Um, so what is the situation? What's it doing here? Um, so we have the, this scenario, um, in the old days, so this arrow should be the other way around, the researchers, like also Peter was introducing it, went to the environment, then found some bacteria that are interesting, like on the slides, on the slide that you just saw, and then they researched intensively, and then they found some genes, some compounds, some complex that they could use, and these arrows should all be the other way around, it's a conversion problem with PowerPoint, um, end up in the uh, result in, in new drugs that can be used. But um, there is now new ways to go on. One more, please. Um, so this is what you see here, um, an exponential graph of the development of the ability, technological ability to read DNA, which is the red line, and to write DNA, which is the, blue li uh, with the yellow line. And in comparison, you have the development of computer chips here, which is the Moore's Law. So every two years, the computer chips double in power for the same price. And you see that the ability to read DNA is actually even faster progressing than the development of computer chips. And the ability to write DNA is in the same pace and probably will hit further exponential growth very soon. Rüdiger, now we do open technology and people connecting. So you just tell him next slide, yeah, please. Yeah, next one, please. <laughs> so what does that mean? We are learning to read the code of nature, and we're learning to speak the language of it. We can read and we can write the code of nature itself. The next one, please. And this results in huge databases, which are storing all the genomes that we read in the nature. So also the genomes of the bacteria which are resistant. So we can actually see what, what their trick is to get around the antibiotics. Next one, please. And we have we are cur uh, currently developing abilities to counter that by um, building um, technology which is decentralized 
So you can imagine it a bit like the development of computers. In the beginning, you had it just in research laboratories, like these giant machines that fill a whole room, a whole hall even in the beginning. And IBM said it's only potential for five computers in the world, I think somewhere in the 60s. And um, then it becomes smaller and smaller and more decentralized, and now we have these super powerful small computers in our pockets. So with the laboratory technology in biotech, it's very similar development, actually. We have uh, the so-called po point-of-care diagnostics coming up now. We have high throughput lab on a chip development, which means that you don't have to do it manually anymore. The stuff is executed on the chip by a, by a machine, the, re the experiments to come up with new drugs. Then we have genome sequencing now, and then we will have mobile labs very soon, and eventually we will have instant results. Next one, please. So this will lead us to a new um, phase of technology development where we can read the analog, I call it analog biology, which you see outside, which we are as well, our bodies, our physical appearances, and sequence that, store it in the cloud, and then execute the code um, that we make of ourselves on uh, automated chips, which is called microfluidics. Um, and then we have the new drugs eventually. Next one. Um, there is one alternative which we could use very well when we have these skills, and that's the phage therapy. The phage therapy is known for more than 100 years, or pretty much 100 years now. Um, phages are little biomolecules that are attacking bacteria and then kill them, and then they proliferate. Um, but they're only attacking bacteria, so they have nothing to do with us. It's just um, the enemy of bacteria. And uh, we can make use of these guys and program them. We can program their genetic code. This is the genome here of one phage. It's, compar it's kind of small. It's like 30 files on it, kind of. And, um, and it's highly specific, and it's very safe. Um, in Russia, Georgia, and Poland, this technology in the Soviet times has been developed and researched. It didn't have the antibiotics. Antibiotics were a development of the West. And um, they have been going on with that research, but in a rather simple way, with sim simple technology. And now we have all these new fancy tools and knowledge, and we can read the code of it, which was not possible back in the days. And now we can make use much more specifically of that. Next one, please. And um, especially to make use of this knowledge properly, I, um, I was inspired by the development of this uh, open source community in, uh, in the, on the programmer's world, which built Wikipedia and Linux and these kind of developments that we heard about before. And um, they were successful because they had um, open licenses, the Creative Commons licenses. And they were mainly successful because they had the share-alike clauses, which are these so-called viral clause. Um, and I think we need to fix the problem of the antibiotics crisis. We have to all work together. We all have to contribute and we all have to share what we see. So we will have this decentralized technology to analyze the uh, bacteria which are resistant and we upload it in the data and then we can collaboratively work on solutions to create phages, for example, which can, s which can cure these uh, specific uh, diseases. And uh, for that, we could just put our knowledge together, share it like, uh, put it under a share like license, and I call this the BioCommons license, um, and then uh, govern that in a democratic way and um, allow for viral growth of the technology so that uh, everyone gets easy and cheap access um, to the cures. Next one, please. Um, and I thought, from starting from that thought, I had the idea that actually if we have this BioCommons license, we can generalize it and we can share all the bio knowledge that we have under the, such a license. Um, so most of the stuff in the world is kind of neutral to us. There's the deep sea creatures, they don't affect us at all. So I call this, this is the neutral world of the biosphere. Then we have the stuff that is concerning us directly. That's our bodies, our micro microbiome, which are bacteria that live inside us. Um, and then there is the environment. And of course, most of the stuff that we encounter is good to us. Um, the plants that we eat, they're good for us. The microbiome that lives on us, it protects our skin and helps us to digest. It's good for us. Of course, there's also these diseases, so we have to take care that not everything is good for us. So next one, please. We need, um, we need uh, when we make this, this biocommon licenses, we need to take care of, um, of these considerations. So we need to think about the ethics and um, combine it with the language that we learn about um, from the nature, um, put it together in some legislation, and then make the biocommons licenses and that, that um, can um, host, that 
um, the databases can be licensed under. Next one. And then if we have these licenses, everyone can contribute to it and uh, facilitate the research and the development of such drugs. Next one, please. And we need a digital infrastructure. And here I want to point to talks that will happen later here in the panel. Um, I just want to give a brief overview into it. We need to have this trustable. Like this, th this um, knowledge is very sensitive because it's about our health. It's about the living environment. Um, and we are, learn we are increasingly getting the ability to modify that. So it is a very powerful tool. So we have to have an infrastructure, a digital infrastructure, to host these databases and the knowledge that we all contribute to in a very, very secure way and very that we can trust, everyone can have, has to trust. Um, and there is um, this idea of the blockchain around the, from the Bitcoin technology. And I think there will be later talks about that. I'm very interested in that. And I thought that is actually very interesting. So we could use such a technology to encrypt the knowledge and store it safely in the cloud. Um, have a democratic way to govern that because you can make votings on that blockchain. That's what I heard about. Um, it's efficient and scalable. It's universal. It has a historical proof. So when you put stuff online, it stays online. It doesn't, it's not deletable anymore. Um, it's decentralized. It's safe and secure. And it's convenient. And there can be access control even because you can encrypt it and then only allow a certain um, type of people to decrypt the knowledge. So if you think this is the only knowledge that should be in the hands of doctors, you make the encrypted and only give the key to doctors. Because it is not all good and it's not all safe, but we need to do something about it. And um, I think that is a feasible way to go on. Next one, please. So this is kind of the vision here. It's the BioStrike, the, the, the future version of the BioStrike project. And uh, we would have a community of citizens that develop software, hardware, and wetware, develop the phages, and give out personalized treatment to everyone on the, on the globe for very low money. Um, next one, please, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rüdiger.